Grow, Sell, and Retire is the podcast for the lazy overachiever. B.D. Dalton, author of True Gravity and Grow, Sell, and Retire, is here to give you his 25 years of secrets, tips, and systems to take your business to the next level. This is your chance to find out what is working in sales, marketing, and running your business. If you stop learning, you stop burning. Now, here's your host, BD, with today's GSR podcast. Hey, everybody, BD Dalton here from the Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in today. I'm going to be talking today with Chris Skinner. He's written a book that is all about artificial intelligence and making sure that artificial intelligence will help us with the next generation of financial advice, of dealing with people, of being smarter, of money. Digital Human is Chris Skinner's book that follows up his previous books, both Value Web and Digital Bank, all about how technology is changing the financial services industry. This is the Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. So when you're looking at retiring, when you're looking at doing something in the future, you need to have investments. You need to make sure that you're focused on changing the world, changing the way that you invest, the way that you interact with money. So I want you to learn how to be that lazy overachiever and have access to people, to ideas, to things that make your life much more simple, get you to your next level, create that lazy overachiever, but mostly enable you to grow, sell, and retire. Here's my podcast with Chris Skinner with his topic, The Digital Human. Chris, what made you write the book? Uh, Well, I'm always writing. Uh, I've been writing for over 15 years. I write a blog every single day and have done since um, 2007 at thefinancer.com. And um, I've written a number of books about uh, the digital transformation that's taking place in banking and finance and became well known as the guy to go to on fintech for that reason. Uh, but Digital Human um, incorporates a little bit more backdrop of some of my global travels since um, my bank, um, my book that was a breakthrough came out, which was Digital Bank in 2014. Uh, and Digital Human is much more around how digital is transforming the whole of our planet, not just um, automating stuff that's been there before. That's cool. So, and a lot of people are talking right now, and they're, you know, I don't think people were as, as scared as they were, but. Um, kind of, especially in the financial world, robo advice and and artificial intelligence and machine learning is, is this enhancing the need for advisors, or is this getting rid of, rid of advisors? Uh, well, I think there's always going to be a role for humans in the process, and um, a lot of what I talk about today is that um, artificial intelligence incorporates a specific area called machine learning. Um, is that if machines can learn everything that's factual, numbers, stats, um, it can do everything that can be automated and get rid of all of the drudgery of jobs, such as checking words in contracts or keeping um, accounting spreadsheets um, consiled and, and together. And what humans will end up doing is actually far more advice because we need to learn the things that machines cannot learn, which is for the humanity. It's about creativity, the arts, emotions, rapport. And um, a lot of the things that will be related to work in the future will be around counseling and relationships rather than about facts and numbers. And that's where we need to focus our efforts. And so people will become, instead of specialists in, in areas, they'll become specialists in people again? Is that kind of where it should take us? Well, it may, it may be a mixture of both. You may be a specialist in um, wealth management, for example, but instead of administering client instructions, which a machine can do, you'll spend your time actually thinking about what the client needs and how to advise the client better. And the machines will then give you more information to augment that service rather than replacing that service. So, and in, in, in this in this space, um, you, you've done uh, you know some great case studies, and you know you have some of the the first. English or, you know, UK-based case studies of, of quite a few different companies. Can you give us an example of some people that are, some companies that are integrating um, AI, robo-advice, and, and the client process? 
Yeah, there's two or three. I mean, my favorite examples are JP Morgan Chase and UBS because they're probably investing the most in these activities. So JP Morgan Chase, for example, have um, automated the best execution processes in their trading and investment um, area. Uh, now, what that actually means is an incredibly complex process. If an institutional investor or a pension fund sends a request to buy some stock, for example, to J.P. Morgan Chase, they can, in that electronic message, say it has to be at the uh, lowest cost of processing or at the best price they can get or at the fastest speed or at the highest likelihood of actually getting that stock purchase. Or it can be one, two, three, or, or four or, of all those things. And that's incredibly complicated, bearing in mind that you're talking billions of instructions like this coming into the bank every single day to high-frequency trading. Now, using artificial intelligence, the banks automate all of that so they can, in a nanosecond, take the instruction and implement it to exactly what the clients requested as best execution. And that's something that's far in advance of anything we had just a decade ago. The same with UBS. And so UBS, for example, uh, any instruction that comes in from a client electronically is now dealt with through artificial intelligence and executed within a second for what would historically have averaged about 45 minutes of human time. And that human time isn't some administrator. It's a high net worth relationship wealth manager who's actually paid a lot of money to deal with client instructions. If you can get rid of the overhead, then obviously your people become more effective and can be far more productive. Those are two awesome examples. So it's, and those are those are companies that people would associate with high net worth individuals, and and making sure that they were able to retire properly and and engage. And if you could drive the price down, that that then means better return for the clients, doesn't it? Yeah, it's all about giving the highest level of service at the lowest cost, and that's really what drives all these banks. I mean, I'm working on a new project at the moment around the banks, I think, are doing digital well in terms of digital transformation, not just digital projects. And it's difficult to track down exactly who those banks are. I've got a list of maybe 10, of which five are actively working with me, one of which is J.P. Morgan Chase. And in the case of that particular bank, there's another great example that I use regularly, which is they have a a large global operation, as you'll probably be aware, with many, many international clients, corporate clients, institutional clients. And the contracts with each of those clients, particularly for investment and trading, are incredibly complex and require uh, a lot of drafting to complete. Now, historically, checking the wordings on those contracts would take 380,000 hours of legal time that's now processed in one second by an artificial intelligence engine. So that's a radical difference. (laughs) <laughs> I just need to get a bit of water but oh, my throat's drying out no it's okay so it's it's one of those things we've and we've done a lot of chats on this show and I run a uh, a thing over here called disruption so we, we we try to look at how people can engage with artificial intelligence with blockchain with all these different things to you know not everybody's going to integrate them into their business but they still need to know about them um, so you're, you're seeing a lot of changes come through with, with artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, and are these things, you know, we come back to the B word and not Brexit, but, but blockchain and what people are talking about. Um, how can somebody understand how banking is changing and is, is that inter- interchangeable with the blockchain and artificial intelligence or those kind of working in unison? Um, Well, I think the problem that most banks have uh, and most large traditional um, financial institutions have is that they're um, spending most of their money on actually just keeping the lights on from a technology perspective. And so we talk about all these hot new technologies, big data, cloud, mobile, social, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, distributed ledger. It all sounds great, but actually being able to get those into the business is really difficult because the bank doesn't have the setup for doing that, both in terms of the existing system structures and the budget to be able to do it, because that's in addition to keeping the lights on. So that's the fundamental challenge for most large additional financial firms. The ones that I'm saying are doing digital well have been working on changing that for, in some cases, over a decade, and they've been moving their operations to cloud computing. They've been moving into 
uh, small team structures called microservices architectures, which means that you have very small uh, agile teams integrating business people with technology people who can develop on a, a rapid turnaround. It doesn't take days, months, or years. Um, but to get to that structure, as I say, takes a long time. I mean, typically, I think for any large bank that's still wrapped up in a large traditional structure of maintenance of old systems, it's going to take them at least five, possibly 10 years to change. And with the rapid cycle change we're seeing in technology, I'm not sure they have the luxury of five to 10 years to change. And so, they, so they've got to choose what they're, what they're approaching or what they're going to be using as part of their things instead of trying to do everything all at once. Is that kind of where, where we have to go to uh, still have to have the budget for it and the people and the man hours? And it's more the actual leadership. Um, it's the theme that comes out of nearly all my books, which is that I don't think banks have the right leadership to do this because a lot of them, for example, think digital is a project with a function and a person who leads that function, um, a chief digital officer. And it's nothing to do with a functional project. It's to do with a complete transformation of the institution from the ground up from the digital aid. The financial institution's business model is all built around the physical distribution of paper and a network of buildings and humans. And now we're dealing with the digital distribution of data and a network of software and servers. It demands a completely different business model and organizational structure and thinking. And if you don't have a leadership team who has that structure of thinking, it's, it's not going to happen. A good example, for example, uh, is that most of the financial firms that I deal with, if you meet their leadership team, their operational leadership team, they're nearly all people who have risen through the financial structure, experts in risk regulation, compliance, audit, and accounting. Where's the digital people? Where's the technology people is my question. Uh, and in the banks that are doing digital well, about half of their executive leadership team are people who are technology people, heads of engineering, heads of data, as well as a CIO, a head of customer experience, and a CEO and a chairman, maybe, who have worked in technology and telecommunications in their career. So they're very different banks. Is it is it kind of the, the same the same glacial change that we had, or, or probably a little bit even slower, it, with the, with the HR sitting in the background? Because used HR used to be just somebody instead of HR teams and human resources and all this stuff that in the '90s came in to make sure that we were, you know, we moved from the union world to this HR world where the employees got more rights and and were taken care of. Is it? Are we looking at that same type of transformation that it takes a long time to now uh, really care about where they're going? Well, I think if you see digital as a company transformation of structure and culture, then it's quite a radical change. It's as radical as what we saw with some of the big technology firms. So I'd love to use the example of um, IBM, for example, under Lou Gerstner in the 1990s, making the elephant dance and turning it around from a mainframe manufacturer to a services company. The same with Microsoft. You know, under Ballmer, it languished into a company that was really focused on subscriptions and licenses. And now it's actually much more about um, being a services company, um, offering cloud and uh, all the latest technologies. So it's really turning the culture of the company around to embrace completely new products and thinking rather than being stuck in its glacial past. That's awesome. And the funny thing is, all the other stuff you're talking about is the stuff that people have been talking about for, for, for many generations, but it's that leadership culture, getting back to basics, but getting back to what's actually going to drive the business forward. And it's, it's, But there's a key point there, which is I've been talking about this since I started my career, which was many moons ago. Um, but it didn't really become that important uh, until recently. The, re the reason why it's important recently is that with the introduction of um, cloud computing, uh, startups are getting to be able to start new ideas on a bootstrap um, rather than having to have millions of dollars of capital. So 15, 20 years ago, if you wanted to do something in banking and finance, you would need to have at least 100 to $200 million of capital before you could even get through the door. Now you can do something with $100, to be honest, because if you've got a great idea, you can create an API, plug and play code, and send it out into the marketplace and see if it takes off. That's what's happened with Venmo Square, Stripe, Klarna. So many of the startups are seeing Revolut, Monzo, because they can do it. And you couldn't do this 10 years ago. You can do it today. So if, if, you're, a, if you're a Luddite and you, you're trying to figure out how to 
learn a little bit more about some of these changes or maybe even interact with um, something that could could kind of move your life forward when it comes to either a, a financial tool or um, something that's coming down AI or machine learning? How can somebody interact with or learn more about that type of stuff? Uh, well, obviously, read my blog, thefinance.com, or my books, Digital Bank Value Web, Digital Humor. Um, but equally, there's lots of other source materials and um, news out there. And so, for example, if you like listening to podcasts, there's a fantastic podcast called FinTech Insiders by 11FS. And 11FS is one of the fastest growing challenger consulting companies in financial services that started just over four years ago. So you've got a lot of new, rich uh, access to information, which we never had before. Um, so just go out and start subscribing to stuff. No, that's really cool. And, so, and we'll, put your, we'll put your blog and uh, the books and everything else in the show notes. So it'll hopefully people will be able to sure. those those items. Okay, so now a little bit of fun. So, what what projects are you working on now? What do you? What's your goal for the year? So, I'm working on a new uh, book, which will come out next year, and it turns out it's going to be two books because um, I got fed up with people saying that banks are rubbish and that they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, because I don't think banks are that stupid, um, but. Finding banks that are actually doing digital really well is difficult because there are not that many um, for the reasons I said earlier. Uh, they don't have the right leadership team. They don't have the right thinking. But there's a few that have definitely got a commitment to make digital transformation happen. And so I've been working with JP Morgan Chase, BBVA, ING, DBS in Singapore, on China Merchants Bank, and a few others to start documenting what can we learn from their experiences that if you do have a Luddite leadership or if you're ch- challenged with how to do this, you can learn from them in terms of what exactly are the step-by-step things you can do. So that, so far, I've got about 25 lessons that they've learned that I'll be sharing in the new book that comes out next year. And as mentioned, it's actually two books because DBS um, in Singapore, uh, what what was interesting is they had me interview pretty much everybody in the round across their organization from the leadership team through some of the middle management in audit, treasury, compliance, and other areas. And they were all consistently giving me the same message around customer focus, customer experience, digital leadership, digital transformation, including even people like the HR and the chief financial officer. So I'm producing a separate book just as a case study about them. Wow, that's that's a challenge. So hopefully, <laughs> and, and that's going to take you the whole year. And so it's and then, so when you aren't writing books and you're you're not talking to banks, what do you do for fun? Uh, well, you know, I uh, spent many years jogging and walking, and I go into a lot of museums and uh, travel a lot and go and see the countryside and other places that I go visit. So uh, those who keep up with my Facebook profile know that I'm, I'm pretty much posting a different view of a different part of the world almost every day. So last week was Bangalore, India. The week before was Sydney, Australia. The week before that was Honduras. So uh, I get around. Wow. <laughs> Very good. All over the place. So you've given us a couple of your, your, favorite, your favorite podcasts. And so we'll put those in the show notes. But um, what what are you using, like tech wise, uh, or or even non tech wise, to kind of enhance your life currently when you're traveling or in business? Uh, I've got a pretty much a routine these days, which is download as many things I can from Amazon Prime and Netflix onto my iPhone Max and listen to that on my flights rather than watching the stupid in flight entertainment that's pretty dull. <laughs> um, and then I have um, you know. Uh, most of the time, my phone or my laptop. Um, and you, you may say, well, why not an iPad or why not a Microsoft Surface? You know, to be honest, they're, they're too big. I either want a big screen laptop because I use that as my television in my hotel room with Netflix, or I want my iPhone. Those are perfect. My, it's. Uh, I think everybody's kind of become, you know, on, on the train. Everybody used to read newspapers. Now everybody's on their phone, aren't they? They're just have their heads down and, and focus on what they're doing. So if you, if you were, yeah, looking, absolutely. <laughs> it's the, the anti-social, social, you know, so, social networks <laughs> that have, that have no social. After, yeah. After Mike made that comment, they would rather sit in a room looking at our phone than talking to our partner or friends. So uh, we'll talk to them through our phone rather than to their face. 
<laughs> text text them in the room with you. It's amazing. So if if you're looking at this and, and we're going through uh, the looking at AI, so people aren't really scared of it anymore. Banks aren't really rubbish. They're still made up of humans. They're just having a hard time, especially some of the behemoths are having a hard time turning around. What quick fire valuable tip do you have for the listeners, listeners if they've just tuned in now for the last minute or two? Uh, sorry, I missed that. I was on that one, Bart. Can you just say again? No, it's okay. So we're looking for a quick fire tip. So either either a business tip or something that has to do with technology or anything else, just a quick fire tip for the listeners. Uh, I think the main thing I'd say is never sit still. Always keep moving, always keep uh, learning. And if you ever stop learning or ever stop being curious, then uh, retire. <laughs> it's, it's great. So thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. And I really appreciate it tuning in from, from Poland. That's awesome across, across the channel. <laughs> um, and thank you so much. And we'll make sure everything gets out in the show notes. And thanks so much. No worries. Thank you, Bob. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us on Grow, Sell, and Retire. For more information, tools, or to book one of our team members to work with your team, business, or to speak at your event or conference, visit BartDaltonConsulting.com or email contact at BartDaltonConsulting.com. Buy the book True Gravity on Amazon. If you want to work for the rest of your life, that is your business. If you don't, that is ours.